Our gospel lesson is John 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord God, speak through me. Speak in spite of me. Speak to all of us your word, your word of comfort, your word of challenge. Amen. Touch. It's a complicated thing. Touch has tremendous positive potential and power. But I cannot speak about touch here today until I also acknowledge that many of us here have been hurt at some point in our lives by touch. And God, God's own self, has also been hurt by touch. See, the Easter story isn't just a story of resurrection. It's also a story of abuse, of mutilation even, of death, of flogging, of Jesus being stripped, of him being crucified, of his body being buried. So, if touch is complicated for you, it's complicated for God, too. And though we might have varying degrees of comfort or discomfort with touch, this passage is inescapably about touch. Today we encounter a risen Savior, who invites Thomas to touch him. And not just to touch him, but to touch his very wounds. And in touching wounds, he invites Thomas to find healing. So, let me tell you a story. When I was 14, my mother was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer. If you know anything about cancer, that prognosis is not good. And so she started treatments, treatments of every kind, experimental, not experimental. And in response to those treatments, in response to the eventual and the already hair loss, my father and my mother shaved her head. Now, it takes a special kind of relationship to have the ability or permission to touch someone's shaved head. As her child, I knew I needed to ask permission. And she gave me permission. My mother's head, that was once full of dark hair, that was now pale and foreign and scary in front of me, my mother's hairless head bowed down. 
and my scared and my tentative hands reached forward and touched not a place of her comfort, a place of her pain, a place of her fear, a place of her vulnerability, a place that showed a sign that she might die. My mother bowed down her head and allowed me to touch the place of her vulnerability. Now she could have said, and had the right to say, no, I'd rather you didn't touch my head, but come sit on my lap. Or come sit beside me, hold my hand. But she gave me that permission. And you see, I had never connected that story from my life to this scripture passage until almost exactly one year ago here in this sanctuary when this passage was read and preached on. And during the sermon about doubt and faith, it was like scales fell from my eyes. I was seeing something brand new in this passage. You see, I've always been a fairly intellectual person who loves the themes of doubt and faith. So I've come preconditioned to this passage, ready to pick up on those themes, ready to engage with the question of how can we use our minds to know God, to love God, to encounter God? How can we use our brains to praise God and to worship God? But a year ago, I had just given birth. And so I was spending less time thinking about studying anything. And I was doing a lot of touch and being touched. For months, I had felt wiggles and kicks inside of me. For months, loved ones and strangers had touched my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and for nearly two months, I had been in constant contact with my daughter. And so this passage was read, and I saw something new in a passage I had actually written seminary papers on before. <laughs> and by the way, it's moments like that, when I see something new in beloved scripture passages, that I fall more in love with our Lord. Because you see, our God is so marvelous and complex that we will never fully understand God. But our God also reveals God's self to us in Emmanuel, in God's world, word and world. God seeks to be known and understood. And so I had a moment a year ago of wanting to jump up and cry out Alleluia as I was both amazed by and newly in love with our Lord at another deeper, deeper level. Because my experience, the way the Spirit was moving through my life and the world was helping me see God in new ways. So I saw this passage is about scared disciples huddling together behind locked doors because, you see, they were publicly friends of one who was just killed. And they were afraid that now violence might be directed at them. Moreover, the one who was killed was the one that they had just accepted as Lord. One that they loved. So they're confused, and they're grieving, and they have no idea what comes next in the story. So Jesus comes to them, and he says, Peace be with you. And this word for peace is the same word that was used by the angels when they pronounced Jesus' birth. This word for peace is the same word that the crowds used on Palm Sunday when he rode on a colt into Jerusalem and they sang out, peace in heaven. So this peace that he says to them is about soothing their rumpled and scared spirits. But this word for peace was also intentionally used to beckon them outside of themselves and their own fear and to remember the promises that he had made throughout his ministry and life. Promises of wholeness, of restoration for all 
of creation. So a resurrected yet wounded Jesus comes proclaiming wholeness and restoration. But Thomas, Thomas wasn't there to hear it. Thomas wasn't there to see it. And Thomas, he doesn't just want to hear. He doesn't just want to see. He wants to touch Jesus. And not just to touch Jesus, but to touch Jesus' wounds. This reminds me of a little child. When their parent or caregiver enters a room, they often want to touch that caregiver. They don't want to just see their caregiver at a distance. They don't want to just know their caregiver exists and loves them. They don't want to just hear their caregiver's voice. In fact, hearing and seeing a caregiver at a distance can even cause distress rather than comfort. That child wants to touch their caregiver and in touching to receive that peace, that wholeness. My friends, this is Thomas. Thomas heard Jesus' sayings during his life and ministry when he said, let the little children come to me. He watched Jesus lay hands on children. To know Thomas, frightened, confused Thomas is like my daughter when I've tried to Skype with her when I've needed to travel for work. She doesn't just want to hear my voice. She doesn't want to just see my face on a computer screen. She wants to crawl through the screen and be able to touch me or have me pop out of it and touch her. We've learned we cannot Skype her and me. It doesn't work. She doesn't just want to know that I exist. She doesn't want to just know that I love her. In fact, faith and doubt are not even part of the equation. She wants to touch me so she can receive that peace. And after all, remember, Thomas has been touched by Jesus as recently as the last time he saw him when Jesus washed his feet. So Thomas has that audacity, that audacity to demand to touch Jesus. And the extraordinarily good news is that Jesus comes again. And this time, Thomas is present. And Jesus says, peace be with you. But he also says, put your finger here. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. He says, it's OK, my beloved child. It's me. It's I, myself, who appears now before you. See, touch, believe, and belong. Believe not just with your head, but know with your whole self that you are loved. Encounter me, wounded yet mighty, vulnerable yet awesome. God is there when Thomas needs reassurance. God allows Thomas not just to put a hand on his risen shoulder, to clap hands in an embrace, but to put a finger in the mark of the nails into the sight of his deformity, into what should be embarrassing and uncomfortable, the very mark of his vulnerability and suffering but also into the mark of his love. My friends, surely this is good news. Because have you, have you ever touched another's wound? Have you ever traced your fingertips over the sight of a surgical star, scar on a loved one? If you have, you know that a moment like that has a lot of intimacy, a lot of vulnerability. It's powerful. And this Alpha and Omega creator, omnipotent, powerful, eternal King and Lord who we worship 
It's not only one who we believe in, but also one that we encounter. This is a God who says, you're mine. You can, as children do, climb all over the lap of God the Father and be safe there. In that action, you will find all the answer you need to if you are loved, if you are worthy. And moreover, you will find that you can invite God into your own wounded places. That God will not be scandalized by anything you can show God. God will not be disgusted. You can see and touch and be seen and be touched and be loved and accepted. Just as you are with your wounds. For the marks in Jesus' hands and the gaping hole in his side show that the risen Christ is the crucified Christ. And that Jesus, in all of his glory, is still Emmanuel. So thank God that our believing is not just heady, it's also relational. And thank God that the Word, the Word who was in the beginning, the Word who was with God, the Word who was and is God, It's not just word, but became flesh. The word dwelled among us and allowed us to see both the risen glory and the crucified vulnerability. Thank God that we get to reach out and touch the hem of God's cloak and in touching to find peace and to be healed. Amen.